Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Pauley, Jr. I'm a dentist uh, practicing in uh, the Atlanta area. Uh, I've been uh, graciously invited by uh, Dr. Palti and Betty to uh, contribute to an ICOI webinar series. Uh, so today we'll be talking about developing a cosmetic blueprint uh, to maximize collaboration with your lab technicians and other specialists uh, using the digital dental technology. Uh, today we'll notice that technology is in, intertwined with digital dentistry. Uh, we'll begin obviously with a, an enteral scan, uh, a CBCT of the patient. Uh, we push that to planning software. And after we get into planning software, we can then utilize that to send to labs for uh, diagnostic workups, uh, immediate provisionals. Uh, and then we can still use that kind of workup to then use prosthetically driven implant placement during our dynamic navigation. But uh, in the center of it all, as well as always, you see that the patient is there. So all of the digital dentistry, I think, really helps us be a little more um, confident and optimize our uh, surgical and prosthetic results for the patient. In my office with the digital armamentarium, we use an intraoral camera, intraoral scanner. We've got a couple of extraoral cameras for 2D photos. Uh, a CBCT, and uh, the dynamic navigation. And then, uh, obviously, again, we want to make sure that we got to get our eyes on there, too. Our eyes and our brain uh, are, are kind of what helps us kind of formulate the treatment plan using all this technology that's available. And the cool thing is the technology available is, is always being updated and new protocols and workflows are being instigated. So it's a good time to mention that if you do have an intraoral scanner or you have intraoral cameras or um, any of your computers, make sure with the support staff that you have, uh, that you're having those uh, current and updated with the most uh, up-to-date software. Sometimes we forget that in our busy practices, but uh, the companies will keep those uh, software changes a lot of times updated once or twice a year. So you'll be a lot more efficient if you stay on top of that. Today, uh, part of my learning ob objectives would be to discuss how we utilize digital technology to develop our surgical uh, and prosthetic treatment plan. And then after we do that, we'll talk about uh, lab collaboration, uh, utilizing this data to how we send it to them and get working with our um, treatment planning and our prosthetic uh, treatment plan. I want to describe the protocols of single tooth and full arch provisionals. And we'll also talk about how we use this technology to uh, work in the uh, final prosthesis workflow. So a longtime mentor of mine, Dr. Ed Mills, uh, had a nice article in the Journal of Oral Implantology about a diagnostic workup. And you know, that's where it all really begins. Uh, you got to get a comprehensive medical history. You want to have your 2D uh, images, your 2D PA x-rays. Uh, and then uh, from that, you decide which other data may be needed for you with your treatment planning. Uh, you've got to really get the patient involved at the beginning. You've got to get their reality of what their current um, situation is, what their expectations are. And as we go along, we'll be able to develop, hey, this is what we're going to, uh, options that we're able to take uh, and on down the road to your uh, restoration uh, get you uh, get the patient involved in their informed consent, make sure they know which avenues they could process through and which may be unlikely in their case and, and go from there. Again, we always want to document everything. Uh, and this also shows us DBCT uh, being uh, read by an oral maxillofacial radiologist. So just remember that all this is, is good for you to, uh, to utilize uh, that was very inexpensive for the read. Uh, and the further we get involved in the CBCTs and the larger ones we have, uh, a lot of those will show structures that we're not really familiar with on a daily basis as a dentist. It's a little larger than our panorex. So I always like to make sure that I've got that in my back pocket so I can make sure if we diagnose any other issues the patient may be having that could be seen on the full CBCT. Here's a great... Um, consensus paper by the ICOI uh, in the past that tells us that when we use a CBCT, we always want to just justify that on an individual basis. We want to make sure that the benefits of the uh, radiation exposure is going to outweigh any kind of potential risk. 
uh, you again, first thing you need to do is take a comprehensive medical and, uh, examination and dental examination. Uh, you should not have your patient in take a CBCT before the dentist or the clinicians even seen them. Uh, in this day and age, we have technology where we can limit the exposure by limiting the field that we need to diagnose the specific uh, condition, whether it be endo where we may do a small field or a dual arch where we would do both fields needed. And again, in the consensus, we see that the uh, recommendation is have the entire volume interpreted. So um, on a decision tree that we'll talk about today, uh, util uh, utilized in our extraction and provisionals, uh, you'll decide with your extraction, it, hey, uh, is it gonna be an immediate placement, a delayed placement, or when we need bone grafting prior to implant placement, what type of provision are we gonna have? Are we gonna have an Essex appliance? Or can we have a temporary screw retained crown? Or as we'll talk also, there's an option of a temporary socket seal provisional. And then finally, we'll use their, their digital imaging planning software to uh, dynamically treatment plan where we want to place our implant and the actual placement of the implant. So I, I think it's a great time here to talk about, uh, in my practice, I'm a general dentist. Uh, I have probably 15 years of experience in the implant arena. Uh, but I still do, I'm pretty much the resturgeon and the restorative dentist, but there are cases uh, that uh, will go beyond my scope. So you need to have a collaboration with, with an oral surgeon uh, as well, uh, or if you're the surgeon, you'll have collaboration with the restorative dentist. All this digital technology makes that so much easier. It's not like we have to send it by mail or uh, put it in a thumb drive and seeing nowadays we can just have a, a Zoom conference and, and discuss things such as a cosmetic blueprint, which would be uh, a workup for us for the provisional or for the patient's uh, final setup. Uh, we can talk about who, where, would it, what type of temporary would be made. Would it be an Essex again or the provisional? And then where or who would be that's doing the provisional? So all that's kind of to be determined. But uh, I, I think this is a nice time to state too that, you know, find your lane and kind of stay in that lane. Uh, the ICOI offers a lot of CE uh, through the years. Uh, they off, offer credentialing. So you can get uh, lots of CE, lots of compendiums and learn specific treatments. Uh, I encourage you to have a mentor that you can uh, discuss more specific cases with. Uh, but till you're very comfortable in uh, doing a specific procedure, make sure you stay in that lane. And if it gets to the point where it's out of your league, then have the appropriate surgeon that you can refer to. Uh, I've got a couple of great surgeons in my, in the Atlanta area, uh, Paul Anderson for one. So I'm never, I'm 61 years old now. It's been a great run with implants, but I'm never going to do any zygomas or, or quad uh, zygomas or intranasal so uh it's got it's nice to have that uh surgeon as well and to know the collaboration is as as far as uh you guys discussing the treatment and the restorative workups here's a great book by dr george romanos that talks about immediate provisionalization so there's advantages when we have a tooth that we take out immediately that we put uh, a little bit of load on uh that uh, his studies have shown that the bone density at the implant is stronger. Uh, it, the imp bone implant contact is imp uh, bone to implant co contact is can be enhanced, and that woven bone around your implant can mature into more coarser laminar bone versus uh, the implant placement and covering over. Another rationale for this uh, shows that it's going to reduce our treatment plan plan treatment time, I'm sorry, stronger bone, again, associated with progressively loaded implants. We have less modeling, remodeling of our soft and hard tissues. Uh, this uh, temporary will also help us maintain our bone grafting material. And the patients always love a provisional restoration if we can, um, if, if, if their situation allows. And again, you have to have the patient involved in this because you'll have dietary concerns and uh, things that they need to do post-op and make sure they're on board. So here's a particular case where we had our, our pre-op PDIP planning. We see that the patient uh, snapped off a lateral 
uh, we had the uh, the good good luck to just place the lateral back on and, and obtain a intra oral scan. Uh, this is a great doctor uh, article by Dr. Bach Lee, which is talking about uh, gingival tissues. So we want to look here and we see phenotypes. We see that there's always, uh, when we look at teeth, they're usually short or square, uh, or they're going to be slender and triangular. The shorter and squares are going to have uh, a thick gingiva. The papilla may be blunted, but it gives you a little more uh freedom to know that hey this might be a great immediate placement because we don't have to worry quite as much about uh the gingival uh tissues pre-op and you can see in the 2d image that he has nice keratinized tissue all around the uh, the root and we have a nice uh, couple of millimeters uh between the buccal edge of the tooth and the buccal tissue Here's a, uh, another nice application uh, from a textbook from Drs. Uh, Rinaldi and Gans and Mottolo. And Dr. Gans has written articles you've seen, I'm sure, of the triangle of bone, which is the base of the triangle is at the nasal uh, base of the nose. Um, and we have the buccal and lingual connections. Uh, and then you want to place your implant right in the, in the middle, and that gives you a nice sound bone. But you can tweak that if possible to where uh, if you move the implant uh, press just a little lingually or palatally, uh, you can still have nice buccal bone of a couple millimeters. Your apex may be a little closer to the bone, uh, but this gives you a chance for a, um, a nice screw retained um, type of provisional and hopefully permanent crown, especially in today's world with angled screw channels. And you see the arrow there, that's also I've been mentioned by Dr. Gans. Uh, that helps us uh, place a cotton row right there uh, in the buckle that will pull the soft tissue away to let you better demarcate, hey, where the bone is. Another um, option to this, I don't have a photo of, but I uh, there was a lecture on the ICY uh, webinar series that mentioned also to utilize your um, uh, retraction. So if when you have, if you've done veneers or full arch, when you'll do your plastic retax, retraction guard, it'll also pull the tissue away, not only from just the anterior side, but pretty much all the way around uh, the arch that you're dealing with. And here we just go further where we've used our intraoral scanner. There's our um, uh, CBCT, our projected uh, implant plan, and then there's the post-op after the implant was placed. In a case like this, you send your uh, collaboration when you start working with your lab, you'll send them the CBCT. Uh, you can send them uh, the um, digital design in like your software design, be it DTX Studio or uh, other types of uh, implant design software. And they will take the cast and digitally be able to remove the tooth uh, and uh, digitally place a tooth in the um, needed uh, orientation. This is a, 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 a nice uh, visualization showing the tooth. It has wings to assist with seating. In this case, I had it milled at the lab, so it's a little stronger, but nowadays you're having more offices have uh, 3D printers, so sprint ray and such. So if you have the technology and the time and the knowledge, you can design your own case. And, and send your file to the uh, printer and have it printed, or you can send it to uh, the lab uh, and they can uh, design the case in the software and then still send it back to you and you print it in your office. In this particular case, when we pick up the provisional, uh, we uh, are using, again, the, you'll see the wings there to help us seat it in the orientation and not have it push buckly. Uh, we'll need pickup material. So I usually use like a Venus uh, temporary material, screw retain, temporary coping for the implant, a cotton swab, uh, a lot of times what we'll utilize to uh, fill the uh, coping hole, some bonding agents, global composite, and then finally a PMMA polishing kit. So you just uh, inject your pickup material around the coping and in your crown, uh, you're able to pick that up. Uh, you take your cotton um, tip out, unscrew the uh, 
provisional and then just utilize the flowable composite to make your uh, emergence profile. Here's a great article by Dr. Stompel and, and Wadwani talking about a custom healing abutment or a provisional and, and they help us maintain our soft tissue and they give the soft tissue stability. Uh, another op a great uh, benefit is they'll contain and protect your uh, bone grafts. Uh, and then we're going to idealize our soft tissue early on, kind of helping us with the prosthetic stage and keeping us uh, where we were uh, when we had to remove the tooth. And in this case, you'll see that we shorten the tooth a little bit. We always tell the patient ahead of time that, hey, the temporaries, we just can't have them in function. We'll make them a little shorter than the other. Won't be ideal, but it's going to be nicer than you having to wear something that you take in or out and we're able to provisionalize you. Another option that I mentioned earlier is, is, is a term that was coined by uh, Dr. Chu, Salama, and Tarnow in the past with articles on socket seal. And this is a case, again, where we're limiting our buccal uh, palatal contour changes. We're enhancing the peri-implant soft tissue thicknesses by keeping everything as it was uh, during uh, pre-extraction. Uh, we're having a flapless extraction, so that way we're not disturbing any bone flow. And we're using a screw retained provisional again as the socket seal to kind of help uh, with our bone graft uh, maintenance. And you can see here's just a couple cases of those. Um, one has healed slightly in the left and the other is probably on the day of placement of the uh, provisional. This is an easy thing for your assistants to do as well. And so a lot of times, uh, I'm out of the chair. The more you turn over to your assistants, the more they really get uh, involved in the team. And, and you'll be amazed how uh, really handy and how uh, efficient and how technically adapt some uh, assistants are. And I've got one in my office that just loves the uh, restorative uh, workflows. Here's uh, another article. Uh, with mentioning socket seal, but again, we're talking about pre preserving our hard and soft tissue architecture, limiting the amount of facial palatal contour change, and again, we mentioned stabilizing the graft. And so you see in this case, it was uh, uh, number 10 was a lateral that was unrestorable. The other teeth had veneers with decay, so we were able to temporize the gentleman with uh, six units of, of a crown and bridge temporary but in the right, you see, uh, in the left first, you'll see the socket seal. And in the right, you just see where uh, with his deep bite, I did not want to have a temporary provisional in contact or even close to contact. So we just let the bridge be our temporary. It doesn't contact the uh, socket seal uh, provisional, but the socket seal helps us maintain our papilla. And you see in the right, we got nice papilla and uh, a nice, uh, still buckle contour. So this is the case that we just looked at. So when we uh, are ready to do the final impression, we're going to use our intraoral scan. And in this case, we use it with an implant workflow. So you're going to take a common scan uh, of, of all the teeth. Uh, in this case, the adjacent teeth with their crown preps. We capture the bite. And then you'll come back and you remove the uh, healing cap uh, you, while you're doing uh, the common scan and it lets you get your emergence profile. And then finally, you'll come back and place the scan body and do the final scan. So if you haven't figured it out by now, uh, the Southern accent comes from Kentucky. I've been in Atlanta for 35 years, but uh, born and raised in Kentucky. I went to the University of Kentucky Dental School and love uh, going to Lexington in April or October and catching um, the races at Keeneland. So this was the um, American Pharaoh when he won the um, the uh, Breeders' Cup uh, Classic. And, and you notice that when um, the trainer is telling his, uh, Bob Baffett's telling the jockey, he's not telling him to go out there and run the horse just around the circle and go as fast as he can. He's got, they've got instructions and a treatment plan that they've developed. So I'd, think that you have to be as well given your lab detailed uh, instructions you want to send them as many photos uh, as you can and and you give them uh, all the notifications of your implants your sizes of your abutments your healing caps they just need all that to be able to 
make a, a correct decision and it always helps them. The more information you give them, the more of a finalized product that you'll get that will be conducive to both you and your patient. So here was again was the beginning with the um, before tooth number 10 was uh, removed. And then here we have with the post-op. So he was very pleased. In my case, I think this is one of those times where when we look at these, I couldn't tell you from this photo uh, which one of the teeth uh, was an implant. And I think that would always be our goal and what we were uh, looking forward to. But again, it's a great way that digital technology has helped us all the way from the planning through the final. Here's another case we'll talk about. This is a traumatic injury. A uh, patient uh, was on the job working and disconnecting a high pressure hose, uh, flew and hit him in the face and, and broke both of his uh, central incisors. So you can see in the digital images, they'd had post and cores and crown in the past and we can see the fracture. And uh, we'll start by then developing a uh, provisional design. So we take the implant planning software, the CBCT and the enteral scan, uh, send this uh, with um, the dynamic navigation um, technology and the bone mesh and the virtual implants to my lab. Uh, this is a case by Root Lab out of Kansas, but they were able to uh, digitally design two adjacent crowns with the seating wings. And now in the planning stages, you can see where the software, we're able to choose a particular implant. Uh, we pick an abutment and we can uh, tweak with our implants again, if we can try to make it uh, possibly screw retain. In this case, we're just, we're noticing a huge incisive papilla. So all this goes into, into play. But when we pick our abutment, a nice thing that I've heard in one of the, uh, Dr. Hong Lei Wong's uh, lectures last year at the um, ICI winter meeting in Atlanta, it was talking about abutment height being a big uh, advantage. If we can have a concave height and at least to be over two and a half millimeters that they're seeing less uh, marginal bone loss in the beginning. So uh, we all know that in the past when I started that we were told that we were just to expect bone loss down to one to two screws <clears throat> in, in the first couple of years. Well, I think now we've gotten to the point where we're getting uh, even less than that or, or, or minimalizing any marginal bone loss. And so in this case, it's very simple that I'll just pick an abutment that is two and a half millimeters from the implant. So that abutment interface is two and a half millimeters from wherever I take the healing head off or the scan body on. I'm never, ever unscrewing anything that's right there at the abutment implant interface. So we're not damaging any of the fibers or impinging any of the bone. And so again, this is just technology again that lets you look, tweak, parallel, uh, look in this particular software, we can look at it in uh, three or four different workplaces, work stages. So we can look at it uh, from mesial to distal or from uh, an occlusal view, just to kind of tweak everything as we're doing our design. After we've done the design, this is when we're able to send these STL files to our labs uh, to have a provisional or um, in the case of uh, doing it in our office, we would just send it to our um, uh, printer or milling machine and have that made uh, as well. So here we see that the lab has sent us back a printed model of the patient. The teeth had been removed. They are the... Um, temporary provisionals with the seating wings. Also in this case, uh, we've got coping access holes since we designed this with our uh, X-Guide uh, dynamic navigation protocols where the lab's also being able to see our position of our planned dental implants. Uh, we're helping maintain our gingival contours. Uh, and then again, the lingual wings are there for us to have seating. So from a surgical workflow review, you use your CBCT, enteral scans, uh, digital photos, a planning software, and then you or the lab design and fabricate the provisional. And then those provisional files can be then imported into your final uh, navigation surgery uh, to uh, perform the osteotomies and deliver the implant. 
<clears throat> this is a great article by Dr. Chu, which talks about immediate implant placement. And in this, he uh, kind of classified uh, the uh, socket left after the extraction. So you see in these two cases on the right, we'd love to try to avoid these if at all possible, because we've got a, a pretty large fenestration uh, on the um, top. And then on the bottom right, we've got pretty much a fenestration all the way down to the apex. So in these cases, we're not going to be able to do an immediate implant. We're going to need to, to graft. But I just caution you on using um, the, the forceps in these type of uh, situations because we're liable to break that small little piece of buckle bone. So here's a cool uh, Benex extractor kit that's utilized for a traumatic extraction. And we'll start with number nine. And so we come out and then we'll sound the uh, uh, bony architecture and we see that we still have a nice all four walls present. And we'll do the same sort of thing for tooth number eight. There's the anchor that's placed. Uh, and then the apparatus is um, hooked up. I call it like a guide wire, but it's hooked to the tooth and then just uh, around your uh, Benix elevator. Uh, in this case, our goal, and, and we were able to achieve Hard and soft tissues remain intact. We did not lay a flap, so we did not disrupt the periosteum, and we we're able to maintain the blood supply. So here's a quick little video showcasing this. But the first thing you do is you just take a slow speed drill. Uh, a lot of times it'll be uh, a root canal tooth. Uh, uh, yeah, or if not, you just go down the uh, pulp canal. <clears throat> There we have um, there we have the um, um, sorry I didn't know if I had sound on there so uh, my technicians left so I'll just let it let it roll but uh, what we're seeing there is attaching screwing in the uh, the post and from this we're able to then attach the the wire. You see, once it's attached, the little T goes into the uh, appliance itself. The little um, ball goes into the uh, the post on the tooth. And then you just make sure that you have solid teeth around uh, on, on adjacent sides. Uh, this is uh, obvious, obviously for a single tooth. Uh, only, but if you had a molar and you needed to utilize this or you could, you just section and, and make uh, three root extractions. And you just gently tighten this and it'll kind of snug up. And then I just kind of tighten and I'll just let it, uh, the pressure be off for just a few minutes and I'll tighten a little bit more and all of a sudden you'll kind of feel it just mm -hmm. give right away. And you see there, there's the tooth that came out right through the socket. We haven't had any uh, buckle bone or anything that attached to it. And we've got our nice full walled atraumatic extractor. Now we take uh, it to the osteotomy preparation. Uh, dynamic navigation is really, really helpful in these cases because obviously we're just going to have uh, the apical uh, three to five millimeters in in, in new bone. And, we're, and studies are telling us now that obviously we would not want to fill that hole um, sock it up with an implant because we want to stay away from our buckle bone. So, uh, and, and in this case, since we're in the front, we're only going to use this for a couple uh, drill sequences anyway. So uh, you see the, the uh, extraction sites, the utilization of the handpiece, and in the handpiece uh, in the middle, we're just touching each time we change a drill just to verify that that's on the incisal edge, the buckle edge, and where it needs to be. Uh, dynamic navigation lets us uh, give confidence knowing we're going to place this implant where we planned it. Uh, this particular type of software uses a bullseye, so it's yellow uh, all the way around to uh, half a millimeter from the final depth, and then it'll turn green when you're ready, uh, when you're at depth. Red would be if you uh, go over. You've also got three screens there to look at uh, in the um, screen as well. Uh, they'll show you an apical position, a buccal lingual or a mesial distal. Uh, I pretty much just focus on the bullseye. My eyes are just looking straight at that. The staff can look and count down depth if they need. Uh, but the cool thing is you see here at 10.9 millimeters of depth, we're only like six tenths of a degree out of where we planned it. 
back to uh, Tarnow's and Chu's article of dual zone uh, management. In this case, we we like the positioning of our uh, implants. We've got them nice and parallel, as you see with our implant analogs to try in. We minimize our facial palatal collapse with uh, temporaries. So you see our copings that are tightened on. Our uh, We then capture uh, the, uh, the provisional. In this case, uh, we're able just to, to load up the uh, provisional holes from the coping holes that we had, put our uh, composite there, and any excess, we're able just to drill through the uh, back up through the uh, coping um, and uh, remove any of that if it were caught in place so we don't have to uh, worry about uh, uh, using a cotton swab or anything at this time. Uh, we, it enhances our peri implant thickness. Uh, we get to keep that nice stip, uh, stippling, stippling uh, helps us prevent tissue discoloration. And again, it's a very minimally invasive procedure. This gives us a little bit of our dynamic navigation benefits. Once again, uh, parallel, parallel, paralleling tools aid in virtual implant placement. So you saw we had nice parallel implants. Uh, also, you see here, it really helps us because that's a huge uh, incisive frame, and so we don't want to uh, put our implant in there if at all possible. Uh, we we can uh, It helps us a lot of times uh, limit any incisions or flat reflection can be decreased. And in this case, we were able to do all three parallel. We did not need any incisions and we did not have to uh, lay a flap. So when we don't lay a flap, we have less disruption of our blood flow. Uh, and in this dynamic navigation, we're also able to do real-time surgical modifications uh, that we would not be able to utilize if we just had a static uh, surgical guide. In this case, we see the temporaries in place, the tissues heal ni healing nicely. Uh, and again, they are just a little shorter than um, his finals will be just so we can protect those. Here, as I mentioned earlier, the biological width, uh, we always like to try to stay um, two and a half, three millimeters uh, away uh, from uh, the gum and have that much healthy tissue, if at all possible. So in these cases, we're able to, to choose those and have those type of abutments that we knew uh, formulated when we have our final provisional. And we can see here that his finals, our teeth are a little longer. Uh, we love the stippling on the lingual and uh, the palate. When we look at the PA, we've been able to maintain the interproximal bone height. Uh, and uh, the patient's very happy. I, I would have probably tweaked those crowns just a little bit more with coloration, but he had no worries. He was so happy with his uh, final results. So a happy patient makes my life easy as well. It's a great article by Dr. Posey that just mentions, uh, in, like in this particular case, uh, he uh, would give a time, um, time limits to uh, what it took him to perform this. So uh, he was saying his uh, CBCT would take 10 minutes, enteral scanning, five and a half minutes. Uh, you, then you generate the patient's uh, digital uh, implant planning, another six minutes. Uh, and that you plan the provisional. Then you export that file uh, either to the lab or to your office. Uh, and you're going to have the meal, uh, the temporary design and meal. Uh, once you come back, we would uh, incorporate that. Uh, provisional into the dynamic navigation and finalize our treatment plan. And after the uh, implants placed 25 minutes, uh, he uh, would then take another 20 minutes to adapt the temporary shell. So he's been mentioning in his particular studies, it takes him like less than an hour and a half to do all this. So it's pretty time efficient. Uh, and then time efficient, it's optimizing the patient's surgery and, and, and hopefully optimizing any kind of uh, final prosthetic results. When we're talking dynamically guided versus freehand, doctors uh, Emory and Block uh, have had um, extensive um, liter literature to review. But you know, our patients nowadays come into the office and they're aesthetic and hygienically minded. Uh, they've already done a lot of research on internet, so they're you know they're looking for the ideal positioning. Uh, and, and, and great aesthetics. So we've got to develop our treatment plan to make sure that the prosthesis uh, where it needs to be for their aesthetics is a way that we can uh, accurately place that implant before and, and help us with that. 
uh, and then the, obviously the improvement of accuracy. Uh, dynamically guided has been shown to be about 11 times more accurate than someone doing it freehand. In my case, uh, I've had uh, the technology for, um, I guess, about eight years. So pretty much every implant I've placed, I place now dynamic navigation guided. So it gives me the confidence knowing that I'm placing the implant uh, where I planned it. And again, this just shows the, the, the graph from uh, Dr. Block's study uh, showing that um, angular deviation was less in guided or dynamically guided versus freehand. And then there's another example where, in our case, it was 10.6 millimeters of depth. We're only half of a degree off. And then you also see that in that right there, a little right of the bullseye, uh, you'll see that the outline of our implant is pretty much in the blue where we planned it. And then the final thing I'll mention there is you see that it's green. So that means we were right almost like a half a millimeter from our final depth. So I'd like to spend a little time talking about full arch workflow. <clears throat> and get a drink of water here. This is another great uh, reference book, uh, Dental Implant Surgery by Dr. Michael Block. And again, as I talked earlier, whether you're the surgeon and the restorative dentist, or you're working with the surgeon, there's some pre-op preparation. So that's going to be data collection. Uh, you're going to coordinate with your surgeon. Uh, if, if someone else is going to do the surgery, you got to coordinate with the lab technician about your prosthesis, uh, the setup, uh, any prosthetic designs, uh, any prosthetic parts, uh, medical history confirmed, and informed consent. His second protocol was surgical protocol. So what incisions are going to be made, what flaps if, if they're needed, uh, the amount of bone reduction needed, uh, where you're going to place your implants, and also, as we mentioned before, uh, abutment placement. After the surgery is performed, then the prosthetic uh, restorative dentist will need to adjust and uh, attach temporary multi-unit uh, copings. Uh, you pick up the provisional. Uh, after it's picked up, you remove it and convert it. Uh, and then refine it into a hygienic um, provisional, polish it, and then come back and do your final uh, seating after you've adjusted occlusal. So just walking you through a typical full case, uh, we'll utilize an aesthetic evaluation where we get all the photos of the patient, CBCT scan, any types of photos or notations that we can help the lab see where the patient's midline needs to be. Uh, any other um, data that might be helpful uh, in the prosthetic design. Uh, <clears throat> if we're edentious, we're going to use a dual scan protocol. Uh, it, this can be either uh, conventional, or in our case, it's usually always intraoral scan. And then we always want to make sure we get the teeth mold and teeth selection. So in this case, we're looking, a uh, patient uh, wanted a, a new denture and a lower uh, fixed implant retained appliance. So we're checking the lip line. Uh, we're gonna look at a snarl line, not so um, needed in a, a lower uh, prosthesis, but definitely in the upper, you wanna always have the patient uh, laugh and snarl as high as they can just to make you get your transition line above this. And so here's an intraoral scan. He had an existing uh, complete upper denture. So we just relined that uh, with some emperor gum uh, got a nice uh, impression there of his um, tissues now. Uh, we cut the uh, impregum off of the occlusal to make sure there was no um, holdup in the occlusal scheme. Uh, this lower scan uh, we're going to take, we're going to want to make sure with both these scans we get full border extensions. Uh, and, and you just take your time and go slow with the uppers, with um, uh, that palate sometimes is a little hard for the uh, intraoral scanner to keep up if you're too far away, but uh, we get a, a full border extensions, we get a bite registration, and then now we're able to utilize this for our, our current jaw relations. The next time uh, I would see this after I sent the data to um, Stephen Balshi at CM Prosthetics at this time, is he'll send back a digital setup according to uh, our specifications, teeth, molds, et cetera, and from this, uh, you're able to look, and you can even show the patient this if you need. Uh, on the left, you'll see they're in the blue. It's their current um, occlusion. 
uh, in the middle is a setup in the teeth. You know, we're always using, looking for implant supported over a denture. It's just going to be minimal overjet, minimal overbite in the balanced occlusal scheme. And you can kind of see in the right, you can work with your transparencies to see how much uh, change you've made uh, from the patient's original uh, to the uh, proposed provisional setup. On the day of surgery, you're going to need pickup materials. Uh, quick Pro or Quick Up is what we'll utilize to uh, pick up our copings, uh, an electric cam piece uh, to, um, to contour and trim the provisional. Uh, some jet acrylic that you'll utilize after you picked it up to uh, finalize the um, uh, coping areas and the uh, uh, tissue side of your uh, appliance. Uh, then you obviously need acrylic burrs and a polishing kit. We need uh, multi-unit copings. I always say get extra screws. Those little guys are like gnats. Next thing you know, you touch a table and they go flying everywhere. So just have plenty of those in case you, you or your assistant drop one. Uh, they'll have rubber dam cut to individual uh, squares that we'll put around our copings, uh, Teflon tape to put in the copings to keep any pickup material from getting in there. And, and then a lot of times we can use a long multi-unit screw as well uh, in these cases. This is a um, article by Dr. Uh, by Dr. Balshi and uh, his son where they have, you talk about the uh, benefits of their milled uh, denture. So this is the patient's upper denture. The lower is gonna be a provisional. So you'll see that we've already got the pre-cut access holes. We've got slots cut on the side where we're going to probably uh, plan to have our uh, final surface. And it's got a seating handle and uh, occlusal stops. This is another wonderful thing about um, digital dentistry. In this case, the patient uh, a couple of years later uh, had an illness, was at the hospital. Uh, they did, misplaced his upper denture. Uh, so with this digital workflows, uh, I was able just to go into his chart, find the um, reference number for his denture and the milling uh, area in the lab were able to uh, mill him another denture uh, that he his son was able to take to him and he could now have in the hospital and just told him to come by and see us if he needed any relining after he was able to come home. After we picked up the denture, you see the rubber dam there in the middle. We're unscrewing this, so it's kind of keeping anything from going under, we, we will take it and uh, cut off our flanges. Uh, and then you'll see that we've got a provisional there with um, an all on six. As we move from four, three to four months post, uh, post delivery of our provisional, we've now scanned our provisional for the lab and the lab's able to utilize this scan uh, and to help mount the uh, mount the cape, so this will give them a, ca a chance to uh, utilize this to help us to determine our um, help us determine our existing vertical, our midlines, our aesthetics, and we notice that sometimes I don't like to rush things, but this is and, and our lab works with me on this in that. We've got the lower teeth in white wax just in case there's any issues with our bite that we captured because this is going to be a porcelain fused to metal um, uh, hybrid. And so you can see that, uh, yes, uh, we've got really nice midline. Uh, we've got a, a pink acrylic that they, uh, or a silicone matrix that they have for our bite is pretty much dead on. So again, the intraoral scan and the digital data is really helpful for the lab and for us to uh, get a really predictable, nice result. So here we see our six implants, uh, our porcelain fused to metal, uh, final restoration over the uh, maxillary uh, CD. Here's a great article by Dr. Craig Mish, uh, and it just talks about uh, more of a graph-less approach. So instead of having uh, an all-on four, which are fine if if that's all that we can. Uh, have room for with our patient. But if at all possible, I like to go to at least five or six. In this case, we're able to go with six. And with his paper, we talk about, hey, graph less. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this study showing using a little shorter implants in the posterior. So these are eight and a half millimeter implants. And so we're able to add two distal to the uh, uh, mental foramens and we're able to just have the uh, 
for an anterior be um, straight up, straight implant, straight abutment, so it makes our workflow so much easier. It's a great article or quote that I always uh, like to hear. Hear I see when uh, with I see Doctor Gans uh, speak, but there's danger when we're bound by two dimensions in a three dimensional world, and so this is just a case that I work with Lars Hansen with and it's just showing how we planned our implants and our provisional uh, with the coping access and coping holes prior to a full arch. These are some great books. Uh, we mentioned Dr. Um, Block's book before and Dr. Um, Gans and Rinaldi. Um, both of these books have great chapters on particular um, procedures, but then they also have uh, some those same procedures in the second half of the book have some cases that are made just along those lines. So it's a great way to rehearse or research a case you may be doing. And you also see Dr. Dwayne Caretu has some uh, great uh, keys to diagnosis and treatment plan, which is another great reference. Uh, Dr. Cullum, uh, mesio, uh, minimally invasive dental implant surgery. Uh, and then we'd also mentioned Dr. Romanos's book earlier. So it's always great to have these books, I think on hand where you can review uh, practice in your mind any surgery that you may have coming up or just for reading pleasure. My wife and I went to Italy um, to the Computer Aided Implantology Academy program last year, uh, and we were able to, to drive by Modin and stop at the Ferrari factory. So in my Kentucky dialect, I'll try to say La Migliore Fiori Chesa Maia Stata Constructa alla Prossima. So for all the youth that need to know a little better in English, the best Ferrari that's ever been built is the next. And I thought that was a great um, quote that he had, um, and so Ferrari had at the museum. So taking that a step further, um, here's an article by Dr. Posey, Posey, which speaks of a traditional screw retained hybrid. And so we need a reduction for restorative space. Uh, we got to conceal the transition line. So you see the flange, uh, and, uh, we want to improve our impl in implant recipient site. And we are, we got to allow our prosthesis to be cleansable. So here's a great, uh, spur retained hybrid. Uh, we, we met the patient's, um, expectations. We're going to do the, uh, the lower arch, um, uh, at a later date, but right now she was happy with her upper. So. It sometimes it gets you thinking, um, and, and Dr. Rinaldi, another mentor of mine, ha has his reference book. And in this one, it had a great quote that the, the most dangerous phrase in scientific progress might be, we've always done things this way. So that kind of got my brain thinking, you know, what, what can we do uh, a, a little different? So in this case, on the left, you see obviously the screw retained provisional uh, hybrid. And then on the right, uh, we've got a screw retained provisional, but we've done it in, in a crown and bridge type of way. So in my mind, I'm thinking if we've got like a 45 or 50 year old and our bone is available, when we're doing uh, single implants, we're trying to do all we can do to preserve bone. Uh, but sometimes we uh, full arch, we may get in and start have to take away bone. So is there a way that we can maybe enhance and keep our bone uh, in the full arch plants. And it, to me, it seems reasonable to think that maybe a 45 or 50 year old, that it would be nice to do the crown and bridge type. So in 20 years or so, if the, something were to fail and they needed other implants, then they would have bone left maybe then for a hybrid. They would not have to go from the hybrid to uh, like a quad or zygomas. So his article went further comparing the dynamic navigation uh, utilizing a screw retained crown and bridge. And in this, we put our implants and prosthesis and we're planning them again in our plan coordinates. Uh, we're going to guide our soft tissue sculpting. Uh, going to immediately load this. So we've saw some of the benefits of an immediately loaded implant and we've got high implant and prosthetic success rate. So we'll walk you through this case of a 68 year old female with the failing dentition. Uh, we've used the intraoral scan of her existing uh, dentition, and we can have those printed so the patient's able to uh, hold those in, in their hand and, and, and visualize them. So in the step before, they could visualize what their 
current setup is. And in this case, they can look at the diagnostic cast and see any changes. It's a little harder to see in this case, there won't be changing it too, too much, but you can see in the occlusal view and then also the buccal view of the lower, uh, where the teeth on the lower now are a little taller and a little straighter. Um, and so with this, it's a great way for us to discuss the treatment plan with the patient. It's also a great way for us if we were working with the surgeon to discuss the, our treatment plan so we're both on the same page. We're developed, we can, we've developed our prosthetic-driven implant plan to the point that we know what the ideal setup is. Now we can utilize this to uh, plan our surgery. As we mentioned before, we can take these STL files, and it's kind of crazy these days, but the STL, OBJ, P, P, T, uh, PYL, all kinds of different uh, uh, initials for uh, stereolithic um, and different uh, setups for the data set that you're seeing in the lab. But with, with these STL files, we can then put them back into our uh, implant planning to where we plan our implants and then have the lab make us the provisional that would go to where we've got our implant treatment plan and then finally utilize that after the uh, provisional is made to uh, dynamically guide our surgery. Uh, also, at this uh, day and age, we have facial scans that we can utilize either with cameras or in our case, uh, it has an uh, opportunity to use the facial scan on the uh, CBCT. And this lets the lab also be able to tweak um, the uh, implant plan uh, and see uh, what what that looks like when they're utilizing the setup for the teeth. And again, this is uh, going back again to our planning software. Uh, this patient it has given me per permission to uh, uh, let her uh, eyes show. So uh, she's seen this and has no issue. Uh, but from this, we're able to import our CBCT and intro scan into our planning software. Uh, we also Im import the uh, facial scan uh, now uh, in a diagnostic workup that the lab sent us uh, of the ideal um, teeth setup. And from there, we'll come back and do our final tweak on any implant placements, abutment uh, height uh, choices. And then finally, we can uh, utilize copings, and that'll help us if we have any angled copings to um, see what angle, either a 17 or a 30 that we might need, and then to see exactly to set that up uh, to where it's coming out, the occlusal of a tooth, uh, you know, not, not, not a buckle or lingual. And again, like we mentioned before, we can export these files to our surgery. This is a, a 2D uh, uh, visual uh, screenshots, but it's just showing the placement of our six anterior uh, maxillary um, implants and the six lower implants. We've got this from the lab that has our provisional uh, that is milled, and then it's a seating jig uh, with a uh, maxillary uh, pallet stop that lets us um, detail our occlusion, occlusal scheme. So you see the coping holes. Are, we've got our vertical dimension established, and we're able to capture these and uh, load these with their established vertical. In this case, we use a um, osteo unit to make sure that we've got appropriate readings to be able to go ahead and immediately load. Again, you see here with this type of surgery, we've minimized any kind of um, uh, flap reflection. We're maintaining our soft tissue contours and we're not really having any bone reduction. Here's the immediate provisional as we're picking it up. We can use the um, wide uh, healing caps to kind of hold everything uh, as we uh, progress uh, through and do any, in this case, a, a couple stitches and sutures post-op. As we do the pickup, as Dr. Block mentions, a lot of times we'll do this sequentially. Uh, with four, a lot of times we'll nail them and it's all together, but when we get into five and six, a lot of times we'll have to do just a little bit of tweaking and, and widening of our uh, coping hole to give us some room for the coping and then give us some room for some coping pickup. Uh, one of the cool things that's coming down the pipe, hopefully uh, first quarter of next year is we'll be able to utilize our current dynamic navigation software. And at this time, as soon as we finish the surgery, 
place uh, scan bodies on these implants and then uh, be able to send that data to the lab uh, and incorporate that with their design provisional to where either later that afternoon or the next day uh, deliver a screw retained printed uh, provisional, which would not have the larger holes here, be less likely to fracture for us uh, and, and, and make our life a lot easier. On the right, in the middle and the right there, you see the uh, stop that shows us where we're uh, helping us with our occlusal stop with the maxillary arch. So this is her on the right after the day of surgery, smiling. Uh, the upper was really nice. In this case, I, I don't uh, utilize a, typically a dual arch. I'll usually just do one arch and then have the patient back. In this case, we had her back in about three weeks and then did the lower. So here you see when we're doing the lower, Again, as I mentioned in Dr. Block's book, uh, we've just uh, sequentially uh, pick up the coping. So we started off with two, uh, and then we'll come along uh, and uh, others as we go. Uh, again, you see the seating jig on the lower that lets us to uh, be able to correctly mount the um, upper with respect to the lower in occlusion. And on this, we did uh, our sutures with the wide body heating caps while the assistant is doing our conversion. There's the final contouring and conversion of the lower immediate. And then there's the delivery of the immediate. And you can see already the how, how nice the upper's looking in like two weeks later. Uh, she's already getting some nice tissue healing. Two weeks post-op, the upper um, is still healing nicely. The lower um, healing very well too. Uh, so there's no issue with us being able to offer this patient a typical FP1 uh, all uh, white porcelain final. So we noticed here again with Dr. Hosey's article that uh, we delivered the implants in prosthesis in our plan coordinates. Uh, we were able to guide soft tissue and hard tissue sculpting uh, and immediately load the aesthetically driven pro uh, prosthesis and, and we're happy with our implant success rates. At this stage, we've uh, taken the patient to uh, a milled PMMA triangle. So we've taken our impressions. We've got her in a lower uh, PMMA triangle. Uh, it looks really nice. She's very happy. We had to uh, love the uh, keratinized tissue uh, associated with our lower implants. Uh, and this could be, uh, in, in one way, this could be a, a final for a patient. Or this, if, if a person was having issues with uh, finances, uh, you, you could have them in the PMMA and change this every two or three years as needed. But this is a way for her to wear this and let us um, uh, be able to give her a chance to uh, make any adjustments that we need and let her see what um, her aesthetics hold. Uh, right before we came uh, to, uh, before we had this uh, webinar, we've uh, started the process with the upper arts. Here's the PMMA trium. We've got great keratinized tissue around these again. So the patient's very, very happy. So this kind of brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, I kind of hijacked this from Dr. Um, Stavros Pelicanos. Uh, I saw it on a Facebook post, but he saw this quote that said, as you think you peak, find you a new mountain. Uh, this particular image is from a trip my wife and I took to Iceland, and we were hiking behind our hotel, and, and you can see that there's a uh, a rope uh, leading up the that little pass. And it shows you, in, in my mind, it comes to the fact that there's been plenty of mentors that have been there before you, as in, den in the dentistry too, and then they're able to guide you and give you their experiences in maybe their mentoring in person or CE or in textbooks. Uh, and then hopefully, uh, you know, I'll leave a couple of ropes or a couple of steps for someone to follow later. Uh, another thing I would mention here is um, the ICOI. I really thank them for giving me a chance to uh, lecture and show you my digital workflow today. But the ICOI is very, um, it's, it's a great way to get your credentials. Uh, so if you have a chance, look at the ICOI um, website. Uh, look at the protocols and the templates that you need to um, develop your cases to first be a fellow. And then when you practice a few more years and done more implants, you can um, submit for a diplomate. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity. It'll kind of, I've, I've done both. 
uh, when we do when we do those and we apply it, it really kind of makes you, uh, for one, it makes you document your cases more. And the more you document, the more you see and the more you like to tweak what you're doing. Uh, it also lets you review what you've done and, and have kind of pride in your work. So if anybody would ever need a question of me, there's my uh, email and mobile phone number. You're more than welcome to give me a, a shout. Thank you again.